Good morning. Today is Monday, October the 15th, and this is The Drill. Good morning. Uh, This is Ron, your host, the only true conservative in the United States of America, because I'm the only one that makes the presumption for the status quo. Your non-determinist, non-materialist, non-skeptical host. Uh, Determinism and the right. Uh, You're going to get the country may be center-right politically, Culturally, it is center-left or solidly left. The example of that, or an example of that, is um, a few months ago, it was um, the majority leader in that in Senate, uh, Mitch McConnell, Senator McConnell from Kentucky, that was uh, complaining that he was, in essence, powerless uh, to get certain things done in the Senate because, and I quote, the parliamentarian wouldn't let him, unquote. So um, this is an example of determinism. This is an example of somebody on the right using determinism and being deterministic. Uh, and it is uh, determinism is the error, the intellectual error that suggests that nobody has free will, that we all uh, are do what we do because we're forced to by powers beyond our control. It's a tempting conceit. Okay, we like to we would like to pretend that our behavior is determined, at least from time to time, at least in situations in which uh, things occur that we do not wish to have credit for. We don't want to have uh, blame. We don't want to be blamed for. Okay, so like uh, Mitch McConnell will accept credit if things go well in the Senate, if things go the way people want them to, then, of course, Mitch McConnell will, of course, uh, claim credit. And by claiming credit, he's, he's claiming that he had free will. Okay, that he had the free will to go ahead and um, uh, do, uh, to make choices and make decisions, and he made the right ones, and therefore he deserves uh, credit for this good thing to happen. But when things don't go so well, when he's under criticism, he's under fire, he's under pressure, then he likes to say, uh, oh, nothing I can do, I'm powerless. Because uh, to blame, this is so weak, to blame the parliamentarian. The parliamentarian is not even a... It's not a Senate position. In other words, it's not a senator that holds the, the uh, position of parliamentarian. It is somebody that's hired by the Senate. It's an administrative position. And uh, so all the parliamentarian does is simply remind senators of what the Senate rules are. But the Senate is the one that creates the rules. If uh, Mitch McConnell wants the rules changed, he can do it. There's a Republican majority in the Senate. So all he does, he goes and uh, whips them into shape puts it to a vote, and everything falls right into place. But he is promoting determinism by suggesting, I am forced to do what I do because of powers, in this particular case, the uh, Senate parliamentarian beyond my control. So uh, today, uh, well, as a matter of fact, I'm just going to take it one by one. When I'm uh, when we come back, uh, the next... Uh, Entry in the uh, Iran lexicon. Hold on. And thank you very much. Uh, and again, I'm going to be reading a, uh, a quote from the Ayn Rand lexicon. And um, I love the Ayn Rand lexicon because it deals with concepts. There is a, uh, it is true that words are uh, arbitrary, uh, man-made, sensible signs with um, meanings imposed on them by convention. That's the definition of what a word is. But it is not true of concepts. Okay, so in other words, what is it that makes a dog a dog and not a cat or a table or a chair, whatever? Dog is a concept, not just a word. It's true that you could use any word. You could call it a a framistan if you wanted to, Uh, like John um, McCain said, you know, call it a banana if you want. 
Okay, he's dealing with words, but not concepts. And in dealing with words and only words, what he is doing is being materialistic. Because the materialists pretend that concepts have no meaning. And that uh, the only thing that means anything is that which you can feel. Touch, hear, see, smell, that kind of situation. BS. But anyway, so uh, Ayn Rand has a lexicon, and it's like it's sort of like a dictionary, because also what one of the things that Ayn Rand drives home that's absolutely beautiful is the idea of coming to terms. You cannot have an argument with somebody without defining your terms. Okay, it just doesn't happen. There's a lot of arguments that take place in our society without the definition of terms. One of them is torture. We, uh, we have all kinds of arguments and disagreements about uh, torture and whether or not we're torturing and whether or not we should torture and blah, 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 blah without bothering to define what the word torture means. How do, how, and it's important in order to make a distinction between what is torture and what is legitimate um, intelligence gathering uh, techniques, what, is, what are acceptable intelligence gathering techniques. So... Anyways, back to uh, Ayn Rand and her lexicon, and today's entry is called Collectivism. Collectivism means the subjugation of the individual to a group, whether to a race, class, or state, does not matter. Collectivism holds that man must be chained to collective action and that collective thought for the sake of what is called the common good. Um, So also, if you hear somebody using the common good, hey, we got to do this for the common good, they are lefty. They're a lefty. I don't care who they vote for. If you're going to act like a lefty, think like a lefty, you're lefty. If you're going to communicate like a lefty, you're a lefty. If you're going to try and bully and intimidate people with words, use words as weapons, you're a lefty. Period. Okay, so when you hear people talk about the common good, they're waxing left. It might be even Rush Limbaugh. Hey, we got to do this for the common good. Oops, you're moving left. Because being on the right means having respect for the individual, trying to create um, not a society, but a civilization. Collectivism, back to the book, collectivism holds that in human affairs, the collective, the society, the community, the nation, the proletariat, the race, etc., is the unit of reality and the standard of value. On this view, the individual has reality only as part of the group and value only insofar as he serves it. And this reminds me of something that uh, Tammy Bruce wrote the book that says the death of right and wrong. And this, again, goes back to demonstrate that right and wrong hasn't died, nor will it die. It may change. Okay, so in other words, what's right and wrong may change from being an individual perspective to a collective perspective. Uh, what is right and wrong may be up for a vote, may be a matter of power rather than as a matter of right and wrong, as a matter of knowledge about reality. Collectivism holds that the individual has no rights, that his life and work belong to the group, and that the group may sacrifice him at its own whim to its own interests. The only way to implement a doctrine of that kind is by means of brute force, and statism has always been the political corollary of collectivism. Fascism and communism are not two opposites, but two rival gangs fighting over the same territory. Both are variants of statism based on the collectivist principle that man is the rightless slave of the state. And I also want to say that by her definition of collectivism in this the second part where it says uh, the only way to implement a doctrine of that kind is by means of brute force. And I have mentioned in the past that um, there's several type variants of collectivism. So- socialism is one of them. Nazism is another. But so is libertarianism. So is objectivism. Okay. Bo- both of those are collectivist um doctrines and we know that they're collectivists because they're idealistic and because they're idealistic and they are idealistic because they fail to make the presumption for the status quo and instead make the presumption for an ideal and uh, once you're uh, trying to create a movement towards the accomplishment of an ideal you you have one of two choices you can either do it by brute force you you're going to basically when you're forming a movement by the way you're creating a collective 
Okay, you have people that are inside the group and you have the outsiders. You're either an objectivist or you're an outsider. You're either a libertarian or you're an outsider. And uh, so anyways, the only way to accomplish their goals would be through brute force, the initiation of brute force, or their second alternative is what they're choosing to do right now since they supposedly renounce brute force, and that is uh, political obscurity. Let's see. Uh, modern collectivists see society as a superorganism, as some supernatural entity apart from and superior to the sum of its individual members. The philosophy of collectivism upholds the existence of a mystic and unperceivable social organism, while denying the reality of perceived individuals, a view which implies that man's senses are not a valid instrument for perceiving reality. Collectivism maintains that an elite endowed, endowed with special mystic insight should rule men which implies the existence of an elite source of knowledge, a fund of revelations inaccessible to logic and transcending the mind. Collectivism denies that men should deal with one another by voluntary means, settling their disputes by a process of rational persuasion. It declares that men should live under the reign of physical force, as wielded by the dictator of the omnipotent state, a position which jettisons reason as the guide and arbiter of human relationships. From every aspect, the theory of collectivism points to the same conclusion. Collectivism and the advocacy of reason are philosophically antithetical. It is one or the other. The political philosophy of collectivism is based on a view of man as a congenital incompetent, a helpless, mindless creature who must be fueled uh, and ruled, huh, must be fooled, and ruled by a special elite with some unspecified claim to superior wisdom and a lust for power. What subjectivism is in the realm of ethics, collectivism is in the realm of politics, just as the notion that anything I do is right because I choose to do it is not a moral principle but a negation of morality, so the notion that anything society does is right because society chooses to do it is not a moral principle but a negation of moral principles and the banishment of morality from social issues. As a cultural intellectual power and a moral ideal, collectivism died in World War II. If we are still rolling in its direction, it is only by the inertia of a void and the momentum of disintegration, a social movement that began with the ponderous, brain-cracking, dialectical constructs of Hegel and Marx and ends up with a horde of morally unwashed children stamping their foot and shrieking, I want it now, is through. Collectivism has lost the two crucial weapons that raised it to world power and made all of its victories possible, intellectuality and idealism, or reason and morality. Uh, and uh, she's wrong here. Idealism it has nothing to do with being an intellectual. Your in, uh, Idealism is fantasizing, period. You sit around and you fantasize. It's, it's psychologistic in nature. The, the two things are uh, antithetical, as she likes to say. Back to the book. It had to lose them precisely at the height of its success since its claim to both was a fraud. The full, actual reality of socialist, communist, fascist states has demonstrated the brute irrationality of collectivist systems and the inhumanity of altruism as a moral code. Collectivism does not preach sacrifice as a temporary means to some desirable end. Sacrifice is its end. Sacrifice is a way of life. It is man's independence, success, prosperity, and happiness that collectivists wish to destroy. Observe the snarling, hysterical hatred with which they greet any suggestion that sacrifice is not necessary, that a non-sacrificial society is possible to men, that it is only the it is the only society able to achieve man's well-being. The advocates of collectivism are motivated not by a desire for men's happiness, but by a hatred for man, a hatred of the good for being the good, the focus of that hatred, the target of its passionate fury is the man of ability. And the hatred of the good for being the good, uh, an example of that is school. Everybody in the audience has ha probably had the experience, either personally or secondhand, of having people uh, tease and uh, bully good students. I've seen it happen throughout school. Tease, make fun of them, and 
uh, bully good students. Uh, maybe not so much in college, but certainly grade school through high school. I know I've been on the receiving end of that, and I've seen others. All you have to do is get an A on a paper, and you're going to have those people that, are, of course, are going to pat you on the back, but you're going to have those two that come along and sneer at you. These are the people that want to try to tell you that uh, street knowledge is just as important or more important than book knowledge. B.S. And uh, don't learn that the hard way, okay? But that's an example of it. Okay, so uh, next, the uh, next one's going to be called Common Good. Not that there really is such a thing, but that's the next entry in the Ayn Rand lexicon. Back in a minute. Okay, and thank you very much. Welcome back. Let's see what we've got here. Uh, oh, yes. Um, Tammy Bruce. I mentioned her earlier. So we got her uh, book here um, called The um, Death of Right and Wrong. So uh, this section she was talking about, um, let's see. Um, let me see. Spin about, what was it? Uh, let's see what champion was saying. Forced marriage. Uh, I think it was had to do with gays and, uh, yeah, it was had to do with uh, gays and the gay uh, lobby. Um, in one of his more bizarre comments, Keller contends that most Americans don't listen to the Pope about more serious social issues. It's actually about the Pope, and uh, but it had to have some things to do about with, uh, with gays, too. But the next section in this uh, particular chapter is called The New Dirty Word. On the May 23, 2002 edition of ABC's program, The View, the network bleeped out the word Jesus so that, according to an ABC spokesperson, quote, viewers wouldn't be offended, unquote. Jesus was mentioned when Meredith Vieira noted that the daily weigh-ins of her dieting co-host, Joy Behar, had ended. Quote, yes, and thank you, thank you, Jesus, is all I have to say, unquote, Behar replied. The broadcast is heard live on the East Coast, so the word Jesus was heard in much of the country. Shocking. It was a tape-delayed version of the program for the West Coast from which Jesus was edited out. The spokesperson explained the decision by saying that ABC does not allow Jesus' name to be used in an exclamation. Under the, quote, under the circumstances, we are concerned it would be offensive to our audience, unquote. The spokesperson continued. Let's be honest here. ABC's bleeping the word Jesus for fear of offending people has nothing to do with fear of offending Christians. It was fear of offending their own elite and more than anything reflective of the most basic intolerance of any uh, religious expression. Now, I've got to disagree with her here on the standpoint. She says, let's be honest here. And it's a, a, um, a fallacy. It's called jump on the bandwagon. Uh, you know, and also suggesting that if you don't agree with her, then you must be fundamentally dishonest. And again, she puts all of this forth on the take my word for it. She doesn't pr produce any evidence or uh, anything else for this. I think that uh, ABC uh, was, and I got to take them at, the, again, making the presumption for the status quo means that I will take their word for it. If they say that we did, in terms of their own motives, Okay, I'm not going to take their word for it that there was a, a study, a study that shows that all uh, people who say Jesus are nuts, right? Well, I'm not going to take your word for that. You have to show me the study or show me where it's located so I can check it for myself. Uh, but in a case of what the, talking about their own motivations, what may have motivated them, I'm going to have to accept and take their word for it unless or until there is evidence to the contrary. So if they say that they did it because they were afraid of offending uh, people, particularly Christians, then I'm going to have to accept that. So back to the book. Uh, let's see. The obviousness of this act should send up a flag over how automatic it was for someone at ABC to make the move. Yes, there were complaints after the fact, which is good, but our concern here is with the ruling mentality of those who control our media and design our popular culture, a mentality that feels the need to bleep the name Jesus. Remember, for the left elite, Jesus is a dirty word. 
If you think ABC was being sincere about its concern over offending, the guests on The View in the weeks after this episode included Chastity Bono, speaking about her new book about lesbianism, and Christian Slater, an actor who has spent time in jail and a drug rehab center after having been arrested for assaulting his girlfriend and a police officer. This is also from the network that brings you NYPD Blue, replete with the bare derrieres and plenty of offensive words. I also have some fond memories of ABC's airing a Victoria's Secret, quote, fashion special, unquote, in 2001, which, yes, I enjoyed, but it had very, very little to do with fashion. Does ABC's bleeping the name Jesus make a little more sense now? It's the hypocrisy that gets me and the fact that people at ABC think we're going to believe them. Now, that is offensive. So, um, back in a minute. Man, thank you very much. Welcome back. And now, the uh, what I like to refer to as the twin... Uh, in this uh, particular collection, which is the Black Book of the American Left. Twin, because both of these uh, writers, David Horowitz and Tammy Bruce, are people with a tremendous amount of insight about uh, the American Left, um, far more insight than Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity have had, um, and uh, even more than I've had. I've li- I grew up also in a socialist household. So uh, I didn't become a socialist, though. I didn't run out and and um, become an activist and throw bombs and things of that nature. But um, so uh, these are people with some great insight about not only the effect of the left in terms on our politics, but on our culture. Um, I had my biopsy four years ago in September 2001, two days before 9-11, having spent the next four or five months in a battle for life alongside others, some of whom would make it and some would not, ever conscious of the uncertainty of my fate, ever more conscious at the end of time, I was struck reading about the 9-11 attackers when I came across the phrase, quote, love death, unquote. It was a phrase that Muhammad Atta, the leader of the terrorists, had written in his instructions to his team, quote, prepare for jihad and be lovers of death, unquote. How can one love death? That is the enigma at the heart of human history, which is a narrative uh, motivated by war between tribes and nations. For how can men go to war unless they love death or have a cause that they love much more than life itself? Lovers of jihad have such a cause. They believe they can redeem the world. This faith is what gives their lives meaning, puts order in the universe, and restores justice to an unjust existence. By conquering the infidel world and instituting the law of the Quran, they believe they can make the world holy and make it whole. The world we live in, unjust, chaotic, uh, chaotic, suffused with suffering, is full of earthly redeemers. They They are both secular and religious. They are people who cannot abide the life they have been given or who cannot wait to see if the end of their time on this earth will bring them a better time in the next. They are radicals who believe that without a divine intervention, they can build a kingdom of heaven in this life on this earth. To realize their mission, both secular and religious radicals divide the world into two realms, the realm of those who are saved and the realm of those who are damned, believers and infidels, oppressors and the oppressed. Radicals are permanently at war. Their lives are a perpetual jihad. We all long for a judgment that will make the world right, for a God who will reward virtue and punish the wicked. Every God of love is also a God of righteousness and death, and that is why the radical program of a redemption in this world is such a destructive force. I once shared this radical faith. Life was intolerable to me without a redemptive hope. This quest for a world transformed brought tragedy to me as it has brought tragedy to the lives of so many others. The 20th century is a graveyard in which millions of corpses were sacrificed to the illusion of an earthly salvation. Whether they are secular or religious radicals, those who believe we can become masters of our fate think they know more than Pascal. But in their search for truth, where do they imagine they have gone that he did not go before them? In the end, their confidence is only a mask for the inevitable defeat that is our common lot, an inverse mirror of their human need. 
I understand Pascal's religion. I understand his anxious bewilderment at a life of no consequence. I understand his hope for a personal redemption and his search for an answer. But I no longer understand the faith of radicals who think they can change the world. I no longer share the belief that men by themselves, without a divine hand, can transform the world we live in and create paradise on earth. Part of my book is a memoir, the story of how I met April, how she stood by me in my illness and nursed me through, and how I began a new chapter in life. I will not spoil a love story in this book by attempting to recount it here, but when April and I had been together for 10 years, she said this, quote, When you die, I tell myself I'll be seeing you spiritually someday again. I don't know how I would live with the thought of you gone if I didn't believe that. I don't know how people who have no belief in God manage. It's a sad way to carry your heart through life, unquote. But she knew I did just that. She said, quote, you need to respect God more. He's been good to you. When you came out of the operating room, you were so handsome and your skin was magical. There was a glow on you. I knew that someone, maybe your grandma or your mom, was looking out for you, unquote. And then she said, quote, you have a mission. Most people are like me and don't, but you have a mission. God is protecting you, unquote. It is a privilege to be loved. I can almost make you a believer, even if believing is not in you from the beginning. You give, and if you are lucky, what you give comes back. And it comes back in ways you would never have imagined. I could not so easily dismiss April's idea of grace unseen. I I knew I had taken risks that others prudently avoided and had escaped unharmed. I'd been felled by a cancer and was still around to talk about it. But what was the mission that might cause God to look out for me? Why would the God of the Jews take a hand in the affairs of one of his children in any case? The biblical point was that God gave us free will to determine our fates. Why would he intervene to change mine? I had a mission once that uh, tragedy altered and brought to an end. I had given up this idea of an earthly redemption. I had come to see the very dream as a vortex of destruction and had become an adversary of such illusions in others. That was the mission April meant. But while I took pleasure in her romantic notion, I, I could not flatter myself to think a providential eye was looking out for me. That was the very illusion I had escaped the personal dream of every radical is to be at the center of creation and the renewal of the world. What I had learned in my life was that we were not at the center of anything but our own insignificance. There was nothing indispensable about us, about me, about anyone. The wars of the social redeemers were as old as the Tower of Babel and would go on forever, with or without me. The dreamers would go on building towers to heaven, and just as inexorably, they would come crashing to earth. Some would take to heart the lessons of the fall, but others would fail to notice them or care. Inspired by the dreamers who preceded them and innocent of their crimes, an unending cycle of generations would repeat what they had done. The suffering of the guilty and the innocent would continue without end, and nothing I could say or do would alter it. The summons I had answered was more modest by far. I was a witness. I needed not to forget what I had learned through pain, and to pay my debt. I needed to warn whom I could and to protect whom I might, even if it was only one individual or two. Even if I had a mission to name, it was about wrestling with the most powerful and pernicious of all human follies, which is the desire to stifle truth in the name of hope. Here's why you cannot change the world. Because we all six billion of us, create it. We do so individually and relentlessly and in every generation. We shape the world as monarchs in our own homes and masters of others in the world beyond when we cannot even master ourselves. Every breeder of a new generation is a stranger to his mate and a mystery to himself. Every offspring is a self-creator who learns through rebellion and surrender, through injury and error, and often not at all. This is the root cause that makes us who and what we are, the good, the bad, the demented, the wise, the benevolent, and the brute. We are creatures blind and ignorant, stumbling helplessly through a puff of time. 
The future is a work of prejudice and malice, inextricably bound with generosity and hope. Its fate is unalterably out of our control. Insofar as this work is manageable at all, it is carried out now and forever under the terrible anarchy of freedom that God has imposed on his children and will not take back. Created by each of us each day at odds with each other and created over and over, the world can never be made whole. It is irrevocably broken into billions of fragments, into microscopic bits of human unhappiness and earthly frustration, and no one can fix it. Blaise Pascal was an agnostic of the intellect, but a believer of the heart. He recognized that his condition was hopeless. Only a divinity could heal his sickness and make him whole. Because science provided no answers to his questions, he trusted in the God of Abraham to provide what no mortal can. Pascal was a realist of faith. He drew a line between the sacred and the profane and respected the gulf that separates this world from the next. He did not presume to achieve his own salvation in this world or in anyone else's. Not so the Redeemer's. They cannot live with themselves or the fault in creation and therefore are at war with both. This makes them profoundly unhappy people. Because they are miserable in their own lives, they cannot abide the happiness of others. To escape their suffering, they seek judgment, the rectification that will take them home. If they do not believe in God or in a God, they summon other men to act as gods. If they believe in God, they do not trust his justice, but arrange their own. In either case, the consequence of their passion is the same catastrophe. This is because the devil they hate is in themselves, and the sword of their vengeance is wielded by inhabitants of the very hell they wish to escape. There's no redemption in this life. Generation after generation, we transmit our faults and pass on our sins. From parents to children, we create the world in our own image, and no power can stop us. Every life is an injustice, and no one can fix it. We are born, and we die. If there's no God to rescue us, we are nothing. In my time, I've found a solace and a consolation in the written word. The universe I inhabit remains a mystery, but I go on living and writing nonetheless, as though there was a reason for both. Almost every day I create an order on the page, which reflects the order I see in the world. Whether it actually is an order doesn't matter as much as the fact that the quest moves me forward as though I were headed somewhere and rescues me from the despair that would overwhelm me if I were not. If I did not believe there was an order, I suppose I would not be able to pursue one at all. The pursuit is my comfort, and the order is my personal line of faith. They put oxygen into the air around me and allow me to breathe. At the halfway mark of the last century, which to me does not seem so long ago, the gifted American writer William Faulkner won the Nobel Prize for Literature, an award, like every other human vanity, bestowed on the undeserving and the deserving alike. Faulkner's most famous novel, The Sound and the Fury, is a title he took from Shakespeare's tragedy Macbeth. In pursuit of worldly gain, Macbeth betrays every human value and relationship that is meaningful to him. In the process, he is stripped of all human companionship and respect until he is only an empty and embittered shell. Having emptied his own life of its spiritual supports, he turns against life itself. Quote, it is a tale told by an idiot, unquote, he proclaims. Quote, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, unquote. But when Faulkner mounted the podium in Oslo to receive his Nobel Prize, he struck a very different note. The year was 1950, the dawn of the nuclear era. Faulkner looked into the eye of his darkest prospect and declared, Come, uh, quote, I refuse to accept this. I believe that when the last ding-dong of doom has clanged and faded, in the last dying red evening, man will not merely endure, he will prevail, unquote. Others criticize Faulkner's pronouncement as mere bravado. What basis could he have for such a claim? But this faith was not wisdom. It was oxygen. It was the oxygen he needed to breathe. April and I acquired a little Mexican dog with black and white markings whose improbable name was Jacob and whose brain is smaller than my fist. When Jacob wags his tail for joy, he does not hide his pleasure, as we, burdened with consciousness, often do. 
Instead, his whole frame is swept into the movement as though life had no reality but this. Jacob is one of the myriad creatures on this earth, ridiculous and beautiful, whose origin is a mystery, and who do not worry about the significance of who or why or what they are. In the morning when I step out of my shower, this little self comes to me unbridled, uh, unbidened to lick the glistening drops from my feet. This is not a ritual of submission. It does not have any meaning for him at all. It's merely his pleasure. What is interesting is that I, a creature who lives by meanings, am also affected by this action. When he does not come, I feel the absence, and I miss him. This is a microcosm of all the visits and vacancies that bring misery and happiness to our lives. We can embrace them or not. This choice which we freely make determines whether life will hollow us out and embitter us or provide us oxygen to breathe. What is ahead of us? Like Pascal, we do not know. Quote, believers and non-believers stand in the same darkness. Neither sees God. Unquote. Therefore, like Pascal, we should wager on life. We should bear ourselves in this world as though we have seen God. Be kind to each other, love wisely, and give to our children what we would have wished for ourselves. And that's the end of chapter 11 from the Black Book of of the American left. And uh, that concludes another episode of The Drill. I thank you for listening, and until next time, have a great day.